let me spell Schrodinger, Schrodinger two different ways. So uh, one is the way you've seen me spell here, O with the umlaut on top. If you speak, if you know some German, then you know what that is. If you don't, and you just want to type, be able to type it with the English characters only, this is how you should spell it. Shuro e dinger. Um, the wrong one is where you just say O and don't put anything else there. That's wrong. If you don't want to put umlaut, it should be O E. So Schrodinger equation. This is the um, first wave equation that uh, that was, I guess, discovered because this is kind of a fundamental law of nature, ignoring relativity. Um, so. Uh, the, this is the first wave equation that was discovered that describes the quantum mechanical, um, well, quantum mechanical nature of nature. Um, so the starting place is, uh, do you guys remember the momentum and energy operator that I introduced last time? Yes, no? Um, so you have to use this as the, Starting place. So let me redo the quick introduction of that. Last time we probably, you know, hurried through it. So it's the idea of operators. And I don't, let's see. <laughs> um, I cannot assume that you have taken linear algebra. So um, the, the goal here is this. We want to have a, um, uh, we want to have a differential equation that's going to be our equation of motion. Do you guys remember back, way back when, when we were doing simple harmonic oscillate, wait, way back in physics 4A, when you were doing simple harmonic oscillator that um, somebody should have derived a, something called the equation of motion, something like um, the two double time derivative position is equal to minus k over mx, like coming from Hooke's law. Yes? Or um, when you are doing waves, somebody uh, should have described, uh, um, derived this equation of motion for like a piece of string on a, uh, for describing wave on a string. Something like if I have a piece of string, so let's say I'm describing y position of the piece of string, then the equation that would be derived is that partial uh, time derivative of that y position, or this piece of the string, actually double partial derivative, is equal to, um, oh, I, I'll do it correctly, v squared, and then double partial derivative of the position with respect to x, the horizontal position. Like, remember seeing that? Yes, um, sorry, I usually write x here, but I kind of did it the wrong order. Um, so this is an example of wave equation, which describes wave on a string, right? And you have seen a similar wave equation that describes electromagnetic wave, right? Now those waves are a bit special. Um, so electromagnetic waves, they would be associated with um, something that's moving at speed of light, something that's massless according to special relativity, right? So Schrodinger's goal was to come up with a wave equation, come up with an equation of motion for whatever wave this wavelength is representing, um, except that it would be applicable to something that has mass as well as something that's massless. Or sorry, no, something that has mass, not massless, because if it's massless, then it's relativistic. It's not relativistic. So he's trying to come up with, he was trying to come up with an equation like this, except that it would apply to something that has mass. Yeah? So, you know, it's a very abstract exercise. So um, let me just uh, shortcut some of this um, whole, um, I call it derivation, but once again, it's not derivation. The Schrodinger equation is the fundamental law. You cannot derive the fundamental from something that's not fundamental. You can only guess at the fundamental 
from the things that are not fundamental. So, uh, so he was trying to guess at this equation, kind of using the classical wave equation as a guide. Classical wave equation is a differential equation. So the goal we have here is a differential equation, which a wave, um, like the wave here. So here, this y as a function of position and time. This is my wave. This wave would be required to obey. So if we are saying that whatever kind of wave all these are, if we are saying this ought to be described by some kind of a wave function, traditionally represented with the letter psi, as a function of position and time. And at this point, it's very mysterious what this function actually represents. With wave on a string, I can actually tell you, oh, this y, it represents the height of this piece of string. But here, um, I don't actually have a piece of string. So, and, um, so this particle, it, uh, it doesn't have to be charged. So it, I'm not necessarily describing electric fields either. So whatever this wave is made up of, at the moment, it's very, um, it's very um, vague. We are not sure what this wave is made out of. You can kind of imagine back when people were doing whole is light wave or particle debate, and when they with the experiments decided light is a wave, you can kind of imagine uh, you know wave of what before they discovered the Maxwell's equations, they didn't know it was an electromagnetic wave. It's so kind of same deal here. It's a wave of something. We don't know what that is, except that we can describe by a function of position and time. So uh, with the Schrodinger equation, let's say we have some kind of wave function psi as a function of position and time. This somehow represents the particle we are trying to describe. Then the next challenge is, all right, we have a wave function. How do we measure its properties? Um, so you have only two guides in measuring the property of this wave function is two of these quantum mechanical assumptions. That when you measure its momentum, you should, it should be related to its wavelength. When you measure its energy, it should be related to its frequency. So this is where last time, we, I simply guessed at this, um, these operators. So let me just write down the operator and I'll kind of explain how they are reasonable. <laughs> so, um, these two are the operators for momentum and energy. So the momentum operator, let me represent it with um, this. This head is just a notation saying this is not a mere number. It's uh, representing some kind of mathematical operation. And the operation it represents, I'm going to write it slightly differently than how I wrote it last time. Uh, last time I wrote it as h over i. This time I'm going to write it as minus i h. It's the same thing, right? Minus i h is h over i. Okay, and times this is a derivative with respect to position. That's what I mean. This is an operator. It's not a function. It's not a number. Um, this only takes on a meaning once you operate on something with this. Yeah? So this is a momentum operator, and this is the energy operator. I H, oh sorry, H bar, uh, forgot the bar. <laughs> I H bar, der partial derivative of time. You could take this as, um, well, you could take this as actually the fundamental assumption that these are the, um, this is my starting place. And this is one of the things that are kind of confusing, not confusing, um, uh, what's the right fr adjective here? challenging about quantum mechanics. In special relativity, you had a clear set of two postulates, the principle of relativity and the constancy of speed of light or universal speed of limit. Everything you did, you started from there. Quantum mechanics has a traumatic childhood. It has multiple different beginning points. So you could use these two 
as beginning point and then get everything else from that. Or you could use these two as the beginning point and then arrive at these two. So we're not going to privilege one over the other. And that's why I didn't want to say these are postulates, because I can actually say, well, these are my postulates. And then I'm going to get at that other thing. So let me just show self-consistency. Yeah? I have a question. So energy, when we define it, it's kind of, I mean, it's like work, right? And it's force over. Did work it, is a change of energy. Yes. It makes more sense to be taking, like, well, things. let me show you how this is consistent with what we are saying here. Yeah. So uh, I want to have a kind of a prototype wave function, which is going to be a very, very simple wave function. It's so simple that we can use that wave function to see if these are correct operators for momentum and energy. And what's the simplest wave you can imagine? OK, you are telling me the shape. So if it has a, a fixed wavelength, it is going to be sinusoidal. By simplest, this is what I mean. So this wave that you saw here, this standing wave, is this the simplest possible wave? What's so unsimple about this, Kevin? Yeah, this is, well, there's multiple nodes. And actually, there's one more thing. Like, what is the standing wave result of? superposition of two waves propagating in the opposite directions. So really, if you want the simplest possible wave, you should have a no end here, so that any wave that's reflecting back is gone. So you have really this. This is kind of closer to the simplest possible wave. Anybody remember the name for this? Wave. You could call it traveling wave, I guess, if you're in one dimensions. We live in three-dimensional world. Um, it, this one happens to be transverse, but it could also be longitudinal. P do people remember the phrase plane wave? Yeah, it's a, let's say, take it in opposite to spherical wave. So plane wave is where you go far enough away that the wave front varies, or the, you know, this height of the waving thing changes only in one direction, and in any other direction, nothing changes. So plane wave is the simplest possible form of wave. And um, this is the mathematical expression for plane wave. Um, plane wave. This psi. Let me use the complex exponential notation, because there's no way around it. This plane wave has some kind of amplitude. And it's a it is a function of position and time in this form. Complex exponential of kx minus omega t. Right? This is plane wave. Or it's the mathematical representation of a plane wave. And depending on what this a is, it could be plane, of many, plane wave of many different things. It could be this plane wave. It could be electromagnetic plane wave. And what we are claiming now is that this could be a representation of the, the matter plane wave. Something that is mass, if it can be represented the wave function, then this is a possible representation of that. And now we want, given this wave function, we want to kind of propose a procedure for measuring its properties, its momentum and its uh, energy. I guess it's kinetic energy. Because the way plane wave is going, it's not interacting with anything, so it probably doesn't have any potential energy. So let's just say we only have its kinetic energy. So the, um, so the procedure for measuring its momentum and energy would be this. This is where it would be so much easier for me to explain if you guys have taken linear algebra and you knew what eigenvalue meant. How many here have heard the word eigenvalue? Some of you, but not enough of you. So let me just write it down, what, it, what the phrase would mean. So I have a mathematical operator. I can act with this on a function. That's a valid thing to do. So I can do this calculation. Given a function here, I can act on it 
with my, uh, let me do color coding. I can act on it with my operator, right? Now, in general, you are not going to get some simple expression coming out the other end. This can be kind of, this had, in general, this doesn't have any, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with this psi, right? But there might be special cases where after you apply this operation, the function you get actually is related to psi. In fact, it might even be related this way. It might even be related as psi times a simple number, a scalar. Let me give it a letter P. In the, under the special circumstances where we have this, we say this is the momentum of psi. Now, if you don't have this special circumstance, then what that would mean is this psi doesn't have a definite momentum. It's a super, it's a combination of a different states, like the standing wave that has two different momentum combining in it. So it doesn't have one momentum, it has multiple different momenta. Okay. So, so this is our proposed mathematical procedure for measuring property of this wave function. We have an operator. And if we have this special wave function, where after acting with operator, if we get the same function back, multiplied by some number, then this some number is <laughs> the measurement of that property. Okay? All right? So once again, I'm not driving any of this. I'm just giving you something that at least is going to be self-consistent. So, um, so that would be the procedure for measuring momentum. The procedure for measuring um, energy would be exactly the same. You are acting with the energy operator on the wave function psi, and hopefully, this psi, if this psi is a, a, a state with a definite energy, then we would get the same function back, except multiplied by some number, and this number would be the measurement of the energy of psi. And here's why we started the, we are trying to describe a plane wave. It's because plane wave is so simple. This is a state that has a definite momentum and definite energy. That's why we are doing this with the plane wave. Because if we did try to do this with a standing wave, we wouldn't get um, momentum because, you know, it's a, Standing wave is not a momentum eigenstate. Standing uh, wave does not have one definite momentum. It has two definite momentums, momenta. So uh, let me do this calculation, do this simple calculation with this plane wave. So I have uh, momentum operator acting on psi, and uh, I only have um, exponentials here. So it's actually a pretty simple calculus step to go through. So, um, I have, all right, so, um, um, so, so I'm going to be doing this. So minus i h bar times this derivative. The derivative is not going to change anything here really. So let me start out with that. I'm going to still have a exponential of i k x minus omega t. That's the derivative of the outside, the unchanged outside. And uh, using the chain rule, I have to take the derivative of this with respect to x. So I get a factor of i k from the derivative. So let me put that here. So i k, that's the derivative. Let me finish with this uh, minus i h bar. Minus i h bar. So this is the result of applying this momentum operator on the wave function. So what we get, this is the wave function psi, which is good. We are kind of looking for that. So this is a momentum eigenstate. It, it's a state of definite momentum. And this number here is the measurement of that momentum. Or let me simplify it. This is, um, so simplifying this, minus i times i is just 1. So h bar k is h bar k. Um, equal to h over lambda? 
That's, this is where we have to remember the simple definitions. H bar is defined as H over 2 pi. And K wave number is defined as 2 pi over lambda. So, you know, H bar times K is H over lambda. So this is H over lambda. So um, the description that I gave is consistent with that quantum mechanical assumption. So at least this operator for momentum is consistent with that expression. So right now, that's all I'm shooting for, self-consistency. I don't want to be you know, telling you A is equal to B, and then tell you B is equal to C, and then tell you A is not equal to C. I want to be able to say A is equal to C. Um, so. Uh, let me do the energy. So for the energy, it's going to be the same thing. So, um, um, so I have this wave function. When I take the derivative, the time derivative, nothing's going to change. It's an exponential. So I will get the same exponential back, a times exponential of i k x. Oh, sorry, let me go slower. i k x minus omega t. So that's the derivative of the outside. Derivative of the inside, i k x minus omega t. So I'm going to get a factor of minus i omega. Right? So that, let me pull that out here, minus i omega. So that's the time derivative in the energy operator. I still have i h bar. i h bar. So. When you multiply this out, um, i times minus i, that's 1 again. You have h bar omega. Is h bar omega same as this expression here, h times frequency? Yes, this is where you should remember that omega is defined as 2 pi times frequency. So h bar times omega is, you know, two pi is cancel out, h times f. Good. So, you know, if I told you that, well, um, this is our starting place, this is at least consistent with what we have discovered in people, you know, trying to figure out quantum mechanics. So, so, um, so now that we know, at least know this is consistent with the earlier description we are using, now we are going to use this as our starting point in introducing Schrodinger equation. Uh, so I haven't actually written down any equation yet. <laughs> um, so I probably should tell you how I'm going to write Sh down Schrodinger equation. This is the process that Schrodinger actually went through. So historically, um, he was actually trying to come up with a relativistic wave equation first. Because by the time of when this came out, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity was known. He didn't want to write down something that was wrong. So he was trying to write down something that um, described a relativistic particle. But um, he had ran into some difficulties, which I won't go into, but he ran into some difficulties. So he gave up on that front. And he, was, he focused on, OK, what's the non-relativistic wave equation? that hopefully won't have the same issues that he had with the relativistic one. And his starting place was, well, I have energy and momentum. And, or I, I don't know where he started. He could have said, I have energy and momentum. So, um, I, so once again, he's not really deriving anything, because this is the fundamental law. He's trying to guess at it. Um, and one way of guessing at it is, all right, what e relationship do I know that has to be, in some sense, be correct? One relationship that he knew that had to be, in some sense, correct was the expression for energy. So he knew that total mechanical energy, or energy, is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. Right? So at least that has to be somehow true even in this new brave world of quantum mechanics. So what has to be true is that, let me write it in this more suggestive version, that energy has to be equal to kinetic energy, or momentum squared over 2m, plus the potential energy, which I guess would be 
um, just potential energy. Uh, potential energy, by definition, is an energy uh, function of position alone, right? It, uh, if it depends on other things, then it's not potential energy. So let me express potential energy as a energy of as a function of position alone. And um, this is the so all of this is a classical expression. The quantum mechanical jump comes in in that, well. I have operators for all of this. So I have energy operator, I have momentum operator, and there's actually a position operator, which I haven't told you because um, in wave mechanics, the position operator x hat is just the x. It, um, just that. <laughs> which, uh, I mean, it is distinct, but it's, so anyways. Um, so. So this can be a relationship involving operators. Now, the one difficulty with that is, once again, these operators, mathematically, they, it's kind of difficult to get that. What does this mean? Derivative operation? Like, it's not a function. So for this to become meaningful, this entire oper set of operators have to be acting on some kind of a wave function. That's where you get an actual equation, actual differential equation, that's going to be the wave equation. So that's the Schrodinger equation. Let me write it out so that you actually have an expression of Schrodinger equation. This is what your textbook would call time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And depending on the textbook, some books actually start out with a time-independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, but I'm doing it the way I do because um, when you see time-independent Schrodinger equation, it looks like something that's super hard to memorize. And it doesn't need to be that way. Because really, the only thing you have to memorize are these. And this is something you can guess at if you remember these. And if you know this, and you know this, then you can write down the entire time-independent Schrodinger equation from memory. And that's going to be related to the time-dependent, sorry, you can write down the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and that's going to be related to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So the time-dependent Schrodinger equation would be, uh, let me write the right-hand side first. So it's uh, this momentum operator acting on the function twice. So it would be, let me write down the function first, psi as a function of x and t. This is going to be acting on this once. Let me write down one position derivative. And um, I'm saving this constant for now. And it's going to act on it one more time to measure, like, so it's like, you know, if you have um, algebraically, if you have this, you know, operator times this gives you this, then, you know, you, when you act on that with the same operator a second time, then you are going to draw out one more factor of p, so you're going to get p squared, right? That's how you measure p squared. Good. So that's how I'm doing the measurement here. Act on with this operator twice, so I get the double position derivative. And I have to write down the co coefficients that I've been saving. I have minus i squared. That's just, uh, oh, is that minus? Minus i squared. I guess it's minus. All right, minus. So I have minus h bar squared, h bar squared. So that's a momentum squared. I need to divide by 2n. Divide by 2n. Good. So this is the kinetic energy term. This plus the potential energy term. Um, with this, um, so this is the thing about this x hat being the x itself. It's not a derivative. So all I need to for this um, acting on or whatever, I just need to multiply. That's it. I'm done. So uh, velocity, uh, so not velocity, um, the potential energy operator acting on the wave function. And after you have acted on, this x now behaves like a variable instead of an operator. Um, so that's the left-hand side, or the right-hand side here. That's uh, equal to the energy operator acting on the wave function, or this. So I h bar, I h bar 
time derivative of the wave function. So this is what um, your textbook will call time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Once again, even though I'm, sorry, Schrodinger equation, even though I'm giving a kind of an appearance of some kind of derivation, that's not what I'm doing, that's not what I'm claiming to be doing. Because this is the fundamental law. It's like, can you derive Newton's second law? It's like, no, that's your starting place. You cannot derive Newton's second law. This is like Newton's second law of quantum mechanics. You, cannot, you can guess at it by looking for consistencies, but I'm not really driving it. This is our starting point. I was just kind of guessing at it by requiring this to be consistent with something that we knew had to be true. So that's the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. 